I appreciate everyone returning this evening. The title of tonight's sermon is, What's Missing from Christmas? Um, many religious groups, probably even today, probably a lot of them today, are having various Christmas festivities, plays and, pa plays and pageants and things like that. And we're not going to be looking at the traditional reasons that we as a church do not do those things. Recently, Andrew and I did record a podcast. Uh, what was the name of the podcast, Andrew? Was it just The Holidays? Um, exploring some of the issues with those, and you can check that out, but that's not going to be the purpose of tonight's, tonight's study. What we're going to be doing tonight is we're just going to consider what most people leave out of the nativity scene, what most people leave out of the birth of Jesus, and, and what's missing from most people's idea of, of Christmas itself. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, um, Lily, bless her heart again, <laughs> um, happened to see the slides for the, for the PowerPoint tonight, and she said, are you really going to talk about that? I said, well, yeah, it's not a traditional sermon. It's not the traditional Christmas sermon. That's not what it is. But it is what really happened. It is what really happened. And sometimes folks forget what really happened. And as folks are perhaps more spiritually minded this time of the year, perhaps it, it allows us to have a conversation with them and, and to, think about, to think about some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. So, what's missing from Christmas? We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 1. Come over to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start reading around verse 18. In Matthew chapter 1, at verse 18... <clears throat> It reads, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. I want you to think about what Joseph was doing in verse 19, in that passage. Before the angel explained things to Joseph, what was Joseph thinking had happened? He thought Mary had been fornicating. Right? He was minded, he was a just man, but he did not want to make her a public example, so that also says something about his character. But not wanting to make her a public example, but he was minded to put her away secretly. And he thought she had done something shameful. He did not understand what was happening, and the angel explains it. But anyway, as we think about that, and that's actually, some of the scholars think about when Jesus was talking to some of the Jews, and they make a comment, and he's talking about being children of Abraham, and he says that they were not children of Abraham, but they defend themselves and they say, we were not born of fornication. And a lot of scholars think that what they are doing is they are disparaging him and where he had come from. Because if you, if you do not believe... If you do not believe, as even some of Jesus' own family, his siblings did not believe, if you do not believe in the virgin birth, then what do you believe about Mary? Now, here's, here's the point. As, as we think about it, you, you might ask about the reputation, and what it is is it was undeserved shame. But that's what it was. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, then you believe Mary did something shameful. Joseph thought she had done something shameful and was thinking about these things when the angel when the angel explains. While he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to, your, 
take to you, marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. But if you don't believe that, then what do you believe? And it is shame. It is undeserved shame. But it is still shame. And as you think about that, the question is, well, why? If those Jews in John chapter 8 who say we were not born of fornication, if they believe that about where Jesus came from, then why did they not stone Mary? And I was kind of wrestling with that this past week, and, and some folks had some good ideas. One reason that they may not have pursued stoning Mary is because in the Old Testament, you had to have proof of the deed. And it goes into some quite graphic detail in the Old Testament. You had to have proof of the deed. Okay? Another reason they may not have pursued stoning Mary is because under Roman law, Rome did not want them exercising capital punishment on anyone. Now, did they always abide by that? No. But that may have been another reason. Regardless, this was Mary's and Jesus's reputation, if you don't believe. If you don't believe he's the Messiah, this was the reputation. It was shame. It was shame. It was undeserved shame, again. But it was shame on the entire family. And you might just think about that. In, in the land of Israel, how they viewed this and how they thought about this, and you might just think about how people, how people would have looked at Mary and how people would have looked at the family. And you might think about what their life, just a little bit about what their life may have been like. And then you might ask the question, if Jesus had not been born, in a certain sense, would it have made Mary's life easier? In a certain sense. Right? But as we think about the nativity scene that is usually depicted, do most people usually talk about this? Not usually, but this is what, this is what her life, this is what the family's life was like. For the Jews to say, we were not born of fornication. That was some 30 years after this. So for decades, this was the reputation, undeservedly, that had been attached to Mary. Then you might think about what they must have felt about Joseph. And, and, and to just consider it. And, and it's just a, somewhat of a, a sad scene because they didn't know. They didn't understand. They didn't believe and things along those lines. And it's just, it's just undeserved shame, but shame nonetheless. Come on to chapter 2 now. In Matthew chapter 2, and I'd just like to read a little bit for this point and for the next one. And now we get to the wise men. Matthew chapter 2 at verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And when Herod, Herod, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They come to Jerusalem from the east. You might ask, how did they know about it? Eh, you'll have to ask the Lord that. I don't know. I don't know. I have my theories, but anyway. But they come, and Herod, when Herod hears the news, he's troubled, and all Jerusalem is troubled with him. When they come and they... They say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Oh, it's, it's a time of great upheaval. Um, and it's troubling. It's troubling to Herod. It's troubling to Jerusalem. 
But then as they come and they, they find where Jesus was, and they, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Verse 11, when they come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And they had opened their treasures. They presented, to, presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took a young child, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Was it a time of exceeding joy? As the wise men come, and it, it says it, right? Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. It was a time of great joy. Was it also a time of intense mourning and weeping and lamentation? And that's the part that usually gets left out of Christmas. To think about it, so much sorrow. So much sorrow. Can you imagine being a new father? You know, it seems like one of the traditional Christmas songs. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. You, you know what part is left out of that song? That Herod put to death all the boys that were two years old and younger. Can you imagine being a new father or a new mother? This wasn't just babies. This was two-year-olds and younger. And your baby boy has just taken his first step at one year old. And then the soldiers come. And now we ask a question. Would those children have ever been killed if Jesus did not come in the flesh? If the word had not come in the flesh, would those children have ever been killed? That's a hard thing to get our minds wrapped around, isn't it? It's just a hard thing to get our minds wrapped around. How would that affect your faith in God? As we think about the things that were happening, and, and as I said, this is not a traditional sermon, but this is a realistic sermon. This is what actually did happen. This is what actually did happen. That Herod put those children to death. It was a time of exceeding joy on one hand, but it was also a time of extreme sorrow, as even Jeremiah had prophesied about. Lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, refusing to be comforted. It's not usually spoken about, but it is the reality of what happened. It was an extremely dangerous time, extremely dangerous time. The wise men were divinely warned to do not go back, right? They were divinely warned in a dream, verse 12, not to return to Herod, so they departed for their own country another way. It was extremely dangerous. Joseph and Mary and the young child, verse 13, they are going to have to flee to Egypt. That's usually not spoken about this time of year. They're having to flee home and go all the way to Egypt. That's quite a journey. 
as you think about it. That's quite the journey. They're going to return after Herod is dead, but then when Joseph realizes that Archelaus has come to power, he's divinely warned once again in a dream, so then they turn to Nazareth, so as it was also prophesied to happen. So they come there. But as you think about, as you think about it, uh, another song that is commonly sung this time of year, Silent Night, Silent Night, Holy Night, All is Calm. I hope they had some amount of calm at the beginning, but it did not last. They had to run for the hills. They had to run. You might think about, um, have, you ever, have you ever wondered about the gifts? Let me put it this way. If someone told you, if someone told me, just imagine you don't have a debit card and you don't have a credit card, and you got to get out of town tonight. And you have, to, you have to go to another country tonight. How are you going to support yourself? How are you going to support yourself? We know, from these, we know from the sacrifice that they bring that we'll read about in Luke's gospel, we know that the family was poor, right? Because they have the poor sacrifice. So when they, when they have to leave, and notice it, man, it looks like, verse 13, now when they had departed, talking about the wise men, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, arise, take the young child, take the young child, flee, flee to Egypt, stay there until I bring you word. Herod's going to seek the young child to destroy him. He arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. How are they going to survive in Egypt? Have you ever wondered about the gifts? You know, the gifts that are included in the, in the nativity scene. They were given something very valuable. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, those gifts. And I wonder if in the Lord's providence, in the Lord's care, in the Father's care, all of a sudden they are given these gifts, and they're going to have to run for the hills to Egypt. And you might just think about resources and, and how you're going to live. How are they going to live in Egypt? However, however long they were there in Egypt, how, how are they going to live? And they had been given something valuable. You might think about that just as a possibility, and that's, that's all it is. But what they had to do was they had to run. It was extremely dangerous. Do folks usually talk about that at Christmas? <laughs> they don't usually talk about that. They don't usually talk about the intense sorrow that was happening. They don't usually talk about the shame that was on the family, but that's this is what was happening. This was the reality of what was happening. But we also have the bigger picture, a, a much bigger, a much larger picture, and we see it in Luke's account. Come over to Luke. I don't want to go there yet. Over in Luke's account, Luke does not begin with, with the conception of Jesus. Luke begins with the conception of John the Baptist. And, and it's interesting to just look at how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all begin because each one begins somewhat differently. Um, and it's, it's interesting to say the least. But in Luke chapter 1, again, it begins with the, with the conception of John the Baptist. You might look... Um, Verse 24, after those days, his wife, and the whole account of Zacharias and Elizabeth, which, by the way, that was, this was going to be Jesus' cousin. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, if memory serves correctly. Um, and John was conceived. Verse 24, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. And the whole account with Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, is absolutely astounding. But anyway, chapter 1, let's look at verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name is Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name is Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly, high, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. 
The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Just pause there just for a second. And you just look at what... You just look at what the angel says. Just look at what the angel says there. And it's, he shall be called Jesus, the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary immediately says, well, yeah, but I'm a virgin. (laughs) It's like the angel is laying out things that are amazing. I mean, this is obviously messianic language, and it's, this is a much larger picture. And Mary turns to herself and says, uh, wait a minute, I'm a virgin. And then it goes on. Um, verse 36, verse 35, the angel answer said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the, power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, um, also, that Holy One who is born, who will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. And then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. She believed. You better believe she believed. (laughs) When she says, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And this bombshell that the angel has just dropped... And Mary says, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. She believed. And as you have this interaction happening between her and Elizabeth, and you start seeing the bigger picture, then you have what is commonly called the Song of Mary from verse 46 on downward. And now come over to chapter, go ahead and come over to chapter 2. We're in chapter 2. At verse 21, this is after the Lord's birth. This was verse 21, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb, as it says. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Behold, there is a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. You don't say. And Joseph and Mary marveled. (laughs) Just amazing. In this span, as you think about the time frame from John the Baptist's conception and the angels saying that Elizabeth was going to bear a child. And it wasn't going to be a virgin birth either. But you have that time and all those things happening with Zacharias where he's going to be mute for months. 
And all of this is happening. And now at this point, and it's just amazing as we think about the bigger picture. Verse 34, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. It's just amazing. It's wonderful and it's astounding, and frankly, the plays and the pageants don't do it justice. <laughs> they just simply don't. When we back up and we look at the bigger picture of what was happening, and we see that there was intense sorrow happening as those children, as those children, and it's going to be after this, obviously, because Herod's going to do this. After the, after the wise men do not come back. But we see all those things happening that we've talked about. And even, but here as it talks about John the Baptist, right? The messenger, the one who was prophesied to come before the Messiah. And this is not when he's 30 years old. This is when he's a child, <laughs> when he's born. And when Mary comes in and when the baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth, through the Holy Spirit, says what she says. And, and all of these things are transpiring. You have the messenger and you have the Gentiles all of a sudden being brought into this. As we spoke about this morning, is destined for the fall and rise of many as well. But here as it speaks about, even here, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, in verse 32. Just an amazing scene. And you have the rise and fall of many. It also says, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And you even have prophetically, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Now, what is that? And that's the cross. That's what it is. That's, it's the cross. Some 33 years before it's going to happen, but it's the cross. All of those things within those first two chapters of Luke, are they usually included in the, in the nativity scene? <laughs> it's a much bigger picture. But it's, it's a realistic picture, and this is what is happening as the word becomes flesh and how that, how that happened. Here in Luke 2, back up a little bit. Look back in verse 8. And it's the account of the shepherds. As Jesus had been born, verses 1 through 7, and then verse 8, they're in the same country, and this is the, the scripture reading. They're in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. Your Bible might have a margin note for verse 14 for, a, for another translation of that phrase, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Might have a margin note. Because another translation of that, or another manuscript, gives this as that verse. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace toward men of goodwill. 
Now that is quite different. <laughs> right? To go from glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, to glory to God in the highest and on earth peace toward men of goodwill. And we might think about just what Simeon said, that the child was destined for the rise and fall of many. Was everybody going to be happy to hear the news of the king being born? Herod wasn't happy. A lot of folks weren't happy. They were troubled by the news. The shepherds were happy. The wise men were happy. How many wise men and how many shepherds? That's a whole other question. <laughs> That's a whole other question. Those who were faithful were happy. Simeon was happy. Anna was happy. Those who believed were happy. And as some 30 years later, as all of a sudden Jesus begins his ministry, and just think about that fact. <laughs> 30 years later, not 12 years, at 12 years, he's in the Jerusalem. He's, he's in Jerusalem. He's asking and answering questions in the temple. His, <laughs> I believe it's Mary comes to him and says, what are you doing here? And he says, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And she says, oh, your father was searching for you. And then he goes home and he's subject to them. How long is he subject to them for? How much longer is he with them? Another 18 years. And it's just amazing how the Lord does things. But as we, we think about the idea, and we think about Jesus being destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel, and you might also notice what was said there in that verse. Verse 35, Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Talking, talking to the parents, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And we think what about what is said back in chapter 2 at verse 11. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. And that's what he is. He is the Savior. You go all the way back to the garden, right? And Adam and Eve sinned. And you have the first prophecy being made, the seed. And finally, he's been born. He's been born, a Savior. But then as it talks about it, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ. It's the anointed one, the christened one, right? The chosen, the one, as it talks about, slain from the foundation of the world. The Christ who is Christ the Lord. And we say glory to God that he is the Lord. He is the Lord. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace toward men of goodwill. And we recognize certainly all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. And I think this is one reason. How hard is it going to be when Simeon tells when Simeon tells the parents, "Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also." And before, back in back in Luke chapter one, in that account of the song of Mary, does even Mary herself need a savior? Yes, even Mary needs a savior. It just so happens she gave birth to her own savior. If you can get your mind wrapped around that, you're doing, you're doing better than Mary. Mary. Mary gave birth to her own Savior. He's the Savior, of, he's the Savior of all mankind, the Anointed One. And we say glory to God, and we say what Simeon said, that the thoughts and hearts of many are revealed. We've seen what is missing from what many people think about this time of year. And, and again, I do not... I'm thankful that I am thankful that people are thankful for Jesus. In a day where atheism is growing, just the fact that there are people who still believe in, on some level in Jesus, I'm thankful for that. And frankly, I'm not going to argue with them if they choose a day or a week out of the year to be thankful for Jesus. I'm glad that they're thinking about Jesus. And you know what, I, you know what we ought to do? We ought to talk to them about Jesus. <laughs> That's what we ought to do. We ought to take the opportunity and talk about Jesus and not let the conversation die come the new year. Right? It's the gospel. And these things that were happening in Luke 1 and 2, were they happening around December 25th of that year? Probably not. 
Probably not. But did they happen? Are we thankful that the Lord was born? You better believe it. We're thankful he was born. We're thankful that the word became flesh. And it, it fills us with amazement and wonderment that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Just amazing. And we know what we must do. That we come to him. We come to him and we bow the knee. We bow the knee to our Savior, to the Christ, to our Lord, to Emmanuel, God with us. The lesson is yours. If you're here tonight, as we think about these things, what's missing from Christmas? Frankly, it's the things we've, we've spoken about. But as we consider our response, that's ultimately the question. What is our response to Jesus? What is our response to Jesus in everything that he's done and everything that he continues to do? That's, that's the question. What is our reaction? So if you're here tonight, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. For as many as have been baptized have put on Christ, according to Galatians. Baptism now saves us. If you are a Christian, but if you've been unfaithful, turn back. Turn back to the Lord before it is everlastingly too late. The lesson is yours, though. If you're here tonight and need to respond, please come while we stand and while we stand.